Walter Becker. As one half of the legendary duo Steely Dan, this virtuoso songwriter and guitarist has given us some of the era's most memorable music. Now Walter Becker goes solo with his extraordinary new Giant Records debut album, 11 Tracks of Whack. Co-produced with Steely Dan partner Donald Fagan, 11 Tracks of Whack highlights a potent and polished sound that borrows from Walter Becker's illustrious past even as it charts a whole new musical course. Ladies and gentlemen, Walter Becker. After uh, Steely Dan, after we made the last Steely Dan record, uh, uh, Donald uh, and I decided we would do uh, different things for a while. And I moved to uh, Hawaii and uh, had a kind of a uh, change of direction in my life there from the, uh, uh, you know, smoke-filled room, urban record producer, guitar player, musician, kind of uh, night owl existence to put it as charitably as I possibly can to uh, you know kind of an outdoorsy health oriented you know lots of good fresh air and sunshine kind of you know physical activity uh, organic food kind of life and uh, you know I did that for a few years before I got back involved however tentatively in the music business I decided that I wanted to uh, after a couple of years living in Hawaii, I decided, well, you know, there was something kind of nice about those recording studios anyway, you know. Always did like those couches and that, you know, those, all those knobs on the console there, echo and everything, you know, you have echo, you put echo on things. That very rarely happens in real life. Uh, and uh, so I uh, sounded out the guys at Warner's about uh, producing uh, some records for them and one of the bands that they had that I liked was China Crisis and I ended up going over to uh, England. I did that first album with China Crisis. I did a, I produced an album for a band called uh, Fra Lippo Lippi. It's a Norwegian band that was signed to Virgin. Uh, I wrote a bunch of songs with Donald. He and I went back and forth from Hawaii to New York uh, for about a year off and on, writing songs for, we weren't sure what they would be for, but uh, we did that for a while. Uh, I did a another album for China Crisis that we did in Hawaii. I worked with uh, Ricky Lee Jones on her Flying Cowboys album. After that was finished, um, I had met a couple of uh, jazz players during the time that I was in LA working with Ricky that I thought, you know, should be making their own records. Uh, amongst them, uh, Bob Shepard and uh, John Beasley, Marty Crystal. I hooked up with uh, uh, Windham Hill Jazz, and, and these guys were signed, and we made a bunch of records for them, and and then some other records for the Tree Local label also, including Andy Laverne and. Uh, Jeff Beal uh, and uh, Leanne Ledgerwood, Jeremy Steig album. It was not as much fun as as actually doing something from uh, you know recording your own music. When you're producing, you're sitting there watching other people play or other people sing, and it's actually more fun to be playing or singing yourself. You know that's kind of the reason I started doing all this because I wanted to play and sing, and it was fun to do that and an interesting thing to do. So I figured. Uh, that the only way to get to do that was to uh, write my own songs and be my own artist. I wasn't exactly sure whether it would be, uh, I knew that I would write the music and do it with somebody. I wrote some songs with Dean Parks and I didn't really have any firm idea. And then as, as time went on, I realized that that was the only thing for me to do. That was the, the obvious thing for me to do and that's what I should do. The songs that are on, uh, on the album were all written in the last couple of years. I started writing various instrumental things and little sketches and pieces and then later writing songs. I have kind of a uh, either an actual list or a list of song titles and subject matters and various little pieces of lyrics in uh, in my head and uh, then I'll just write music and as I'm writing music I'll look, look on the list to see if anything fits uh, or sometimes you get an idea that's just you know a lyrical idea is right there with that musical idea, fresh idea. And I would find that, uh, you know, if, as I was writing, that a lot of times, you know, the, the most amusing thing going on was going on right there in my house or in my neighborhood or with my wife's older kids or whatever. And uh, usually I would try and twist the things in some way to make them, you know, fit, you know, my overall uh, 
warped conception of what songs should be about. Surf In or Die was a song that I wrote about uh, an incident that happened uh, in our uh, with some friends of ours in Hawaii where um, a young guy was killed in an accident and uh, you know it was a very uh, shocking you know for a young healthy person that you know well and you know loved family and everything uh, to uh, suddenly not be there one day uh, and I remember going to the they had a little sort of a memorial service for him and the uh, one of the Tibetan lamas from the Dharma Center in Paia, the town I live in, Hawaii, came and uh, uh, had a, said a little piece there. And uh, it was a very moving, and I could see how uh, his uh, perspective on uh, the con continuum of life and death and the, the whole Buddhist, uh, Tibetan Buddhist uh, thing kind of made the whole thing a little less uh, meaningless and senseless seeming. And anyway, I wrote this, uh, this poem about it later and it became a song. At some point after that, uh, my wife uh, said, hey, uh, she had met uh, four of these monks that were hanging out in Paia, had come over, a couple come over from Tibet, and she said, how'd you like these guys to come up and, uh, you know, uh, say a prayer or a blessing in your studio, you know? And I said, great. And I started thinking, well, you know, I've got this track here. I'll just, uh, why don't we just record the blessing, I thought, you know? And I thought, well, why don't I just record the blessing on the, right on this piece of tape with the song on it and see what happens, you know, and not play the song for them or anything, but let's just let them go in and do the chant. And then they went in and they did this, uh, these prayers, this actually a series of uh, prayers that they do, and uh, we recorded them. And then after they left, we uh, listened to the track with the prayers on it along with the rest of the music, right, just to see what it sounded like. And it was in the same key, and it was right in rhythm with the track and everything else. And it was the, you know, prayer for the departed, you know, and so on. So I figured, great. And I, and, and I wanted, you know, and the song itself is basically a kind of a pedal point bass line, you know, drone underneath there and everything. So we ended up using it. I kind of started working on this and wrote and writing songs at the same time that I was working with Donald on Kamakiri at, right? But I wanted to have that finished before I started uh, anything else because I just th thought it would be better. Uh, and the result was that in the intervening uh, period of time, I had written some more songs, and my conception of what the album should be had drifted slightly. And then I started writing some new songs, and before I know it, I had, you know, 25 songs instead of 10 songs or whatever. But, uh, you know, they didn't fit together in any particular way. So at the point when Donald arrived, you know, I had, you know, 20 songs, you know, almost all of them completely, you know, just tracks and a few vocal things and bits and pieces and a couple of things that were pretty far along and, and you know, there was a lot of um, weeding out to do and so on. Uh, originally, I sort of thought, well, maybe, you know, I'll find a singer or I'll do instrumental music, and that those, you know, that phase lasted about a week and a half, and then I realized I'd have to be the singer. And uh, I, I don't, I think the qualms really started when I started doing the vocals, <laughs> and uh, I realized what I was up against, and there was a bit of a learning curve and so on to try and get the best, you know, um, it's easy to get uh, obsessed when you're doing this. Don and I worked together for so many years, and uh, we had such a uh, uh, interwoven uh, musical uh, perspective on things that we, a lot of ideas and uh, attitudes that we kind of develop collectively. That uh, even though uh, we don't work together all the time like we uh, did, uh, I still find that um, uh, you know, and I think Donald does too. That that. I maybe have a better grasp of what he's trying to do and he has a better grasp of what I'm trying to do than anybody else would. And there's less that needs to be explained and, uh, and you know, we're the most likely to come up with useful suggestions and what, you know, I, I, when, when I've noticed with a lot of people try to help me do something uh, or, you know, have an idea for something that I'm working on, it seems like a very ordinary idea. And usually if Donald has an idea, it seems like a very, uh, you know, uh, original and striking idea it may not always be what I want to do or something like that, but at least it's you know something that would, uh, if I did it, would be uh, you know um, uh, would be something uh, different than what everybody else does. So uh, 
we continue to have that relationship, you know, uh, um, even though we don't, you know, we live 5,000 miles apart and we don't, aren't working together all the time. So it, it makes us useful collaborators for one another. Donald had been uh, doing shows for a number of years and uh, with the Rock and Soul Review. And uh, uh, one night I sat in with them at a club, uh, one of their shows in, in New York, and that was fun. And then the, a couple months after that, uh, we went out uh, on a little tour for about two weeks, uh, and that was fun too. And, and we could, by then, he had already experienced the enthusiasm that there was to hear some of these Tilly dance songs performed, you know so much so that it interfered with to some extent with some of the other things he was trying to do in the live performances because people just wanted to hear these steely dance songs so we kind of agreed at that point that when common Carriad was finished we would do a tour put together a band and do a tour and play you know some of the old steely dance songs some of donald's new songs and my songs that that i was going to record and so on for this tour we're mostly going to places we haven't we didn't go to last year when we started the tour last summer, I was doing four songs in the show. And uh, I just felt like, uh, as I was doing these songs, that people were so desperate to hear these Steely Dan songs and to know that they were going to get, at least have a chance of hearing these other songs, that I felt better just doing two songs in the show. And I think that's what I'll do this again this summer, and just give them enough of it to pique their interest. Little Kavai, well, that that's my son, Kavai, and uh, I found uh, my... My studio is about 40 minute drive from my uh, house, you know, so I ended up doing a lot of commuting while I was working on this record and and one day I had this idea for this little waltz, you know, and and it kind of started putting together these little verses just for a laugh, you know, and I have a lot of things that I write, either uh, songs or, um, you know, little, little ditties or little, uh, you know, texts or something just for the amusement of myself and the people around me just because you're bored or whatever and you need, a, need a, a joke. And this kind of grew out of one of those things. And uh, after, uh, you know, uh, my wife heard it and a couple of other people heard it, I realized I would get so many brownie points if I recorded this song. If I could only see my way clear to record this song and put it on the album, you know. And, and I was a genuine expression of, you know, uh, fondness for my son. When I originally started writing some of these um, tunes, I was writing instrumental pieces, and they were very uh, empty-sounding, spare-sounding things. I was trying to write without ever having any static chords as such, and I would have a bass line and a melody and rhythm elements, you know, and some little percussive harmonic things maybe, but not, you know, much chording or comping. And Down in the Bottom was one of those songs where it was just a bass line, drums, and a melody, right? And it was so simple that that's kind of all you needed to have a pretty good idea of what it was. And uh, as I went along working on the record, you know, as you hear it, when you hear it sound that way, it, you know, you add, you think, oh, I'll just add a little something here, you know, and a little something there. So it kind of did fill up with stuff, but it still kind of has that effect of, you know, being the interaction of a bass line and a melody that uh, describes the whole tonal thing. You've been listening to Words and Music with Walter Becker featuring his new Giant Records release, 11 Tracks of Whack. Words and Music was written and produced by Davin C. and engineered by Keith Blake. This program is copyright 1994 by Warner Brothers Records and no portion of it may be copied or transcribed without written permission.